crossing the Alps, defeating the Austrians, and Europe at peace. What a meteoric rise it had been for the young Corsican. He had just taken charge of a nation that appeared to be losing a war and turned it all around, securing French gains in Europe. But there was now a big question. You see, throughout the chaotic French Revolution, French governments had struggled to keep the economy afloat. They often didn't have a whole lot of support and they frequently came and went. Would Napoleon finally be the man who could stick around? Military victories were one thing, but could the general also govern? Spoiler alert. Yes. The economy's crumbling? Well then why don't you have yourself a new national bank, currency reform, and improved taxation and welfare systems? The legal system is an incoherent mess? Well then why don't we nicely wrap all those civil laws up into one new centralized legal code? Corrupt government officials? Throw them in the trash. Bad infrastructure? Throw it in the trash. Women's rights? Throw them in the trash. Wait, really? Well, yeah. Unfortunately, while Napoleon was building on the equality of the revolution, he also largely scaled back rights for certain groups, and husbands had full legal control over their wives. But come on, ladies. Maybe let men have a slice of the pie for once, okay? Napoleon further reformed education, ensuring a system based on individual ability, meaning now Simeon had to compete with everyone else, and Napoleon could get the cream of the crop to help him run the republic. But he wasn't just building on the ideas of the revolution. The revolution had led to a lot of chaos, and Napoleon needed stability. So he rolled back a couple things, most notably with religion. The revolution had pretty much kicked the Catholic Church to the curb, but Napoleon understood that since many French citizens still considered themselves Catholic, that could be a problem. So he came to an agreement with the Pope and brought back the Church, only this time with some pretty hefty power limitations. He also ensured freedom for other religions, and is often noted for his positive treatment of Jewish people at a time of widespread anti-Semitism. But while all of this may make Napoleon sound like a pretty stand-up dude, it's good to note that he believed in religious freedom because he thought it was a powerful tool to keep the poor from eating the rich. Or something like that. Overall, Napoleon's aim was to end the chaos of the revolution and finally create a stable and prospering French Republic. And in that aim, he seemed to be largely successful and generally popular with the people of France. He officially declared that the revolution is over, adding, I am the revolution. Napoleon's head could be seen for miles. Of course, not everyone was happy with Napoleon's reforms. Conservatives felt he was too radical. Radicals felt he was too conservative. But since Napoleon was a dictator, opposition could usually be stamped out with some good old-fashioned iron fisting. In 1804, Napoleon took one last major step. After some failed attempts were made to assassinate him, he wanted to strengthen his position and ensure his dynasty could live on after him. And so he decided being first consul for life simply wasn't quite enough. He decided he should become emperor. He held a vote, asking the French people if they were cool with the idea, and they returned a definitely not rigged 99.9% .9 in favor. The balls on this man. And so on the 2nd of December, 1804, in an elaborate ceremony at Notre Dame, Napoleon was made emperor. The Pope was even invited to attend, and normally he would crown an emperor. But to make sure everyone knew this wasn't some Charlemagne-style circular power division, Napoleon lifted the crown and placed it on his own head. Like I said, the balls on this man. He was now Emperor of the French. Well, Napoleon, you were a general. Then he became First Consul for life, and now you're an Emperor. Is it enough yet? Is your ambition finally satisfied? Hmm, I don't know, Pierre. What comes after Emperor? I would say, God, sire. You want to be a god? Yes. I'll put it down under maybe. Okay, everyone. What the hell is going on? This Corsican guy showed up out of nowhere, and he's kicking our ass! He's exporting the ideas of the French Revolution wherever he goes, and he just declared himself King of Italy and Emperor. He can't do that! I'm the Emperor! Oh, hey fellow monarchs. I see you're having a monarch party. My invite must have got lost in the mail. I'll just set up a spot right here. Wow. You don't belong here, Napoleon. We're coming to take you down. I'd like to see you try. Whoa, I'm so scared I just pooed my pants. Hey everyone, I just pooed my pants. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I did just poo my pants. Before Napoleon had even declared himself emperor, the British had already redeclared war on France because both sides had been violating their previous treaty. Napoleon immediately occupied Hanover and then began making plans for a great British invasion, partially paid for by selling a huge chunk of land to the United States. Napoleon gathered his army along the English Channel. But here was the problem. 
While Napoleon's powerful army would almost certainly obliterate the British on land, there was very little chance he'd actually make it across the channel, because Britannia ruled the waves. This power dynamic would keep the two traditional enemies from engaging in much real direct combat throughout the Napoleonic Wars. However, the British had something else up their sleeve. Copious amounts of money. They were willing to throw cash at anyone who would go to war against Napoleon, and there were plenty of takers. Austria, Russia, Naples, and Sweden, hoping to put Napoleon's France back in its place, formed the Third Coalition against France. The coalition forces probably thought that this time they stood a chance. They weren't prepared for the total humiliation they were about to suffer. The War of the Third Coalition was Napoleon at his best. We've already learned two ways in which Napoleon was a great military commander, but here comes one of the biggest reasons. Speed. He had reorganized his army into corps, which were themselves, basically, small armies. Each had their own infantry, cavalry, and artillery, and as a result, was able to act more independently. They spread out through the countryside, and by living off the land, rather than relying on heavy supply trains, they were able to move extremely quickly. Napoleon would traverse massive distances, outmaneuver his enemies, isolate them, and then move in for the kill, before they even knew what was going on. Lightning warfare leading to total destruction. Would you like to see him do it? Here we go. Part of the coalition's plan was for the Russians to meet up with the Austrians and take on Napoleon together. Combined, they could turn the tide against him, so Napoleon needed to stop them from ever meeting. But he's all the way over in Boulogne. No problem. In a matter of weeks, Napoleon marched 200,000 men in secret, encircling Austrian General Mack and capturing his entire army. A devastating blow. Napoleon later remarked, I have destroyed the Austrian army by simply marching. Next, he turned to face the approaching Russians. Okay, it looks like the French are coming for us, but check this out. I've got an amazing idea. When they approach, we run away. Sir, you're a genius. The Russians began to retreat with Napoleon giving chase, and since his tactics relied on quick victories, this could be a problem. Especially because the longer the war went on, the more likely it looked other countries may join the coalition against him. But Napoleon knew the Russian Tsar, Alexander I, was young and seeking glory. So he came up with an idea to lure him in. He sent him a message. What does it say? Um, it says, hello, I'm just a little baby boy. And I'm very scared. Are you talking like that or is he? He is, sir. Why is he doing that? I don't know, but it's very cute, helpless, and vulnerable. Hmm, a little baby boy, eh? Very scared, eh? Cute, eh? Boris? Get my crossbow. We're going hunting. The Allied forces turned to face Napoleon, who they now believed was in a vulnerable position. He was set up at Austerlitz, and to make it look like he was retreating, he had even evacuated the high ground. A thick fog set in, obscuring Napoleon's center, as the Allies took the bait and set up on the heights. From there, they spotted Napoleon's very weak-looking right flank, and they descended the heights to go get it. Little did they know, it was exactly what Napoleon was hoping they'd do. The next thing they knew, a large French force was emerging from the fog, launching a huge central assault up the hill. They swung around, crushing the Allies, and as men attempted to flee across the frozen lakes, Napoleon ordered his artillery to fire on the ice, causing an unknown number to drown. But he told me he was just a little baby boy. What happened? He tricked you, sir. You mean, I was the little baby boy all along. It was Napoleon's masterpiece, and Austria were once again forced to make peace with France. Then, with the French conquest of Naples in 1806, the War of the Third Coalition ended as yet another Napoleon victory. This was the third time Napoleon had had to give Austrian Emperor Francis a good spanking. And so, with the peace treaty in 1805, Napoleon was determined to punish him. He was forced to give up territory, hand over significant compensation, and promised never to fight Napoleon again. For now, Russia, Sweden, and the UK remained at war with France, but none were able to offer much of a threat. And so, Napoleon got to work strengthening his grip over Europe. He gave out rule of captured territories to his family and friends, and most notably, he established a new confederation in Germany, with himself as its protector. Seeing his influence in Germany being wiped away, Emperor Francis acknowledged reality and officially dissolved the Holy Roman Empire, an entity that had existed for over a thousand years. But it wasn't all good news for Napoleon. For one thing, Spain had earlier allied with France in 1804, because the British just couldn't help themselves from blowing up Spanish ships, and Napoleon hoped a combined French-Spanish fleet would eventually be able to invade England. Unfortunately, he received word that British Admiral Nelson had engaged his fleet at Trafalgar. 
Normally, naval battles looked like this, but in this case, Nelson did this. Was it because he was an idiot? No, it's because he was a genius. He successfully punched through the Franco-Spanish line and unleashed hell. His victory ensured British control of the sea, and his death during the battle made him a legend. Napoleon's hopes for a future British invasion were gone. But not just that. Napoleon was also hoping to secure peace on the continent, but that wasn't looking likely because the Prussian king was under pressure from his wife. Frederick, he's established a confederation in our turf, and he told us he'd give us Hanover, but then offered it to the British. You have to declare war on him. What is it with you and war? What is it with you and being a cupcake? Go to war! Okay. In October 1806, Prussia, with its famed military tradition, joined the coalition and declared war, beginning the war of the Fourth Coalition. Unfortunately, Prussian King Frederick William III wasn't the smartest tool in the shed. Look at him over there, being all French. Makes me sick. Boys, we'll get him this time. But here's the thing. This time, we have to stick together. Do not under any circumstances face Napoleon by yourself. You all saw what happened to Austria. Uh, hey, where'd Fred go? Hey, you jerk. Think you're some kind of big shot? Huh? Want to tangle with Fred? You don't got the cojones. We're screwed. Without consulting its allies, Prussia had gone ahead and sent Napoleon an ultimatum, demanding he move all his forces out of Germany. Now, some of you watching this video probably can't even wipe your own bum bum yet, but even you know you don't just send Napoleon an ultimatum. Obviously, Napoleon went in for the kill. Prussia's army was quite outdated, so when they met Napoleon at the twin battles of Jena and Auerstedt, it wasn't even close. Even Marshal Davout's heavily outnumbered corps at Auerstedt sent the Prussians running, and Napoleon carried out a ruthless pursuit of his fleeing enemy, taking Berlin and within a single month decimating the Prussian forces. Frederick William and the remnants of his army moved to the east. At this point, Napoleon's forces were pretty tired. Winter had come, and conditions were miserable. He anticipated both sides would settle into winter quarters, but Russia decided to try their hand at an unexpected winter attack. A series of brutal battles followed that took a heavy toll on both sides, including the vicious Battle of Eilat, fought in blizzard conditions. Men froze to death, and many deserted. The Russian artillery tore the French to shreds, and Napoleon himself was momentarily under risk of being captured. In the end, the French army was saved thanks to a legendary cavalry charge by Napoleon's flamboyant cavalry commander, Murat. After the horror inflicted on both sides, they decided it might be a good idea not to do any more fighting until after winter. Then, after winter came, and the fighting continued. The Russians were pushed back to Friedland, where Russian General Bennigsen made a bit of a blunder by positioning himself with the Allo River to his back. The French artillery were able to pin the Russians between the river and their concentrated gunfire, a major element in Napoleon's fighting style, and many Russians drowned as they tried to escape. War of the Fourth Coalition. Victory, Napoleon.